What an appropriate song for a beautiful morning like this. How delighted we are to be together and how thankful we are that each of you are with us as well. It's a beautiful day uh, here in the springtime and we hope that you can enjoy it for those uh, visiting and vacationing or maybe just stopping here going on to your next stop or destination. We wish you safety. Please come again and stop and see us when you're next in our area. And certainly for our visitors that might be from the community, we hope to get to know you better. Please let us have that opportunity when our time of worship is concluded. It's graduation season, so to all of our graduates, we've been saying congratulations and we continue uh, to do that. We'll honor our high school graduates Thursday night of this week, so hope you'll be a part uh, of that. But whether it's uh, college graduation or high school graduation, kindergarten or some other program, whatever it is, we're proud of you and your uh, achievements. And uh, certainly we rejoice with you for the good work that you've done. Uh, I know that um, I'm showing my school pride or trying to. My little bell tower's here from Freed Hardeman. We have some Freed Hardeman folks here. We have some Harding folks here. We're not going to start up a rivalry with that, but uh, it's good friendly competition. Uh, and we have some tech graduates, some UT graduates, and probably some scattered all in between all of those places. But uh, thank you uh, for all that you've uh, done. And again, congratulations to you. Can we find Jesus in every book of the Bible? That's the question that we started with all the way back in January. And someone might say, well, preacher, just take a concordance and you won't find Jesus in Genesis. You won't find Him in Exodus or Leviticus. And uh, certainly this morning we're ready to consider the book of Ecclesiastes. I've looked and I don't find Jesus there. You're right, by name He is not found. But what we have been able to see and what I hope we'll see this morning is... We can see Jesus and we can see the gospel even in these Old Testament books and how they move the story of God's redemptive history and His desire uh, to work with us and for us uh, to bring about His purpose. And so this morning, what is Ecclesiastes? Well, some might say it's just a wise man's analysis on the futility of life. And if it's lived only for what this life offers, apart from consideration of what awaits in eternity, maybe that's the right assessment. But just because it worked out kind of the way that it did, I'm going to use this title this morning. Ecclesiastes might be the Bible's graduation speech. The Bible's graduation speech of sorts. I've sat through a number of commencement speeches that both I was a participant in as one of the graduates and just there as a spectator or a supporter of those who are graduating. And many of them are, we will say, less than memorable which is another way of saying they're quite boring. I hope the book of Ecclesiastes, though, doesn't present you with that same thought as we study it this morning. Uh, if you want to see a big overview of it, I've recommended to you before uh, that you can visit the uh, Bible Project YouTube web uh, side or the, uh, the website on YouTube of the Bible Project, and they give you a good little animated drawing of how the book all fits together, and I think that's a good start. Let me give you my brief just kind of summary overview of the state of the book in a couple of statements, and then we'll really dig in and see what the book is about. The book begins uh, by telling us about one named the Kohelet. The Hebrew word means one who assembles, one who gathers people together. And most of our English versions will just say the words of the preacher in chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the teacher. Presumably this individual had gathered an assembly together to hear, to inform them, to teach them about spiritual things. Well, he further identifies himself as the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And some might quickly then conclude, well, that's Solomon, is it not? He is the son of David who followed his father on the throne. And that much we know to be true from what the Bible tells us. But uh, there are others who will disagree and think that a later king is using this in the sense of son of David, just meaning a descendant of David, one who came after him. Others will say that uh, this term is meant to be kind of just a pen name or a pseudonym of sorts. Uh, I, I don't know which of those answers are uh, the best. I, I tend to have my favorite, and that is that I think that Solomon is the author, and I'll give you some reasons why, especially when he begins to talk about what he had tried in life, and how he was able to try it, it fits best, at least in my analysis, that Solomon would have been uh, maybe the only man on the planet, either past or even down to the present, who could have said what he said. 
and been factual in saying it. Of course, the Holy Spirit, whoever uh, was the human author, guided uh, the words of this book that come down in the fashion we have them today. Now, another question that is of interest, uh, perhaps, is this. Is the author and uh, the, uh, if you want to say, the preacher the same person or different? Now, you may say, well, how could that be? It's the same person, is it not? Well, perhaps in verses 1 uh, and 2 of chapter 1, uh, where he talks about everything being vanity, then uh, in chapter 1, verse 3, all the way through chapter 12, uh, verse 7, uh, you have an analysis of life. And it's something that even is perplexing to uh, the one asking the questions and taking us along on this journey about what life is like. And then when we go to the last chapter, chapter 12, uh, verse 8, we see another summary statement like the used, uh, one used in chapter 1, verse 2. And then because the preacher was wise, verse 9, there is a concluding statement. So whether or not these individuals are meant to be taken as two separate uh, personages or if it's just the same individual writing in the way and in the manner that he did, again, makes little difference. But what immediately jumps out on the page, especially as you read verse 2 of chapter 1, is this. This word vanity. Vanity of vanities. Says the preacher, vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The Hebrew word is hevel or hebel. Uh, Different people uh, put a V or a B there, and depending if you know Hebrew, uh, why that should be the case. I'm not <clears throat> as well qualified as others maybe to explain that distinction to you, but what is that? What does even the English word vanity mean today? It's not a word that we use even very frequently in our conversation. Really, the word simply defined is this, meaningless, meaningless, Futil, uh, futile or futility, absurdity. Those are all words that could be used in place of this word vanity. Meaningless. Meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Are you scratching your head yet? Are you asking, are you sure that's in the Bible? Yeah, it's in the Bible. I'm reading it like you are. Are you sure though that that's what it means? Well, interestingly, that same word is translated elsewhere as the word for breath. A mist, vapor, wind, or even smoke. Uh, that's about the best that I could do with an image uh, to try to picture what smoke is like. But something that appears substantive. Something that appears to be real. And in one sense it is real, but yet at the same time there's no true tangible substance to it. An interesting, almost ironic sort of way of viewing life for sure. But here, when the Bible says, vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity, uh, that's a, a way of expressing it, the literary device, for emphasis. We read, for instance, in other places that our God is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. What does that mean? It doesn't mean that He's one among many. It means that He excels them all. He has no peer. The holy of holies, that most holy place. It excels in holiness above every other location. That's where God told the people He would dwell between the cherubim. So this idea of vanity of vanities is the strongest possible way of saying this is what the preacher is concluding. The teacher is observing that life is meaningless to this degree. Are you sure? Another term that he uses often about nine different times in the book is the idea of grasping for the wind. Grasping for the wind. What, what do you mean by that? Well, he will tell us, you know, if you were going to uh, try whatever life might have to offer, verse 14, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Just reach out and grab the wind. We're inside. There's not natural wind blowing. Maybe the air conditioners are running to kick on to circulate the air, but just reach out and grab it. Can you grab it or will it simply slip through your fingers? You know the answer without me telling you. Uh, life seems to be like that. I reach out to grab it. It seems so real. I can get all that I want of it or can I? I reach out and grab it and yet it's gone. Vanity. 38 times in this book, the preacher, the teacher will say, it's vanity. What do we do with that? Well, I think what he begins to do with that and what the purpose that 
uh, introduced at the start, the benefit for our graduates, and you don't have to be a graduate this morning, so don't tune out if you say graduation was a long time ago. This is true for all of us. We need to understand it on a kindergarten level, if that's just what you've completed. We need to understand it on a high school completion level, college, or whatever stage of life you're at. We need to grasp this idea about what life is really about. And so he's going to try to help us. And he starts by, I think you could maybe describe it in this way. He starts by saying, let's play the pretend game. The pretend game. Have you ever played the pretend game? You've played the pretend game. The pretend game goes something like this. If I just had more wisdom or education or knowledge, I'd be happy. Life would be meaningful if I could just get to this certain stage of educational attainment. Well, maybe that's not for everyone. Not everyone's a nerd. These last two, though, really appeal. And you say, let's pretend if I could just make pleasure, unbridled pleasure, doing whatever I wanted to do, whenever I wanted to do it, however I wanted to do it to bring me pleasure, then life would be meaningful. Or, if that's not your particular approach and you think it to be a bit too hedonistic, you'd say, well, you know, money does make the world go round. And that thought is expressed in not uh, exact language, but pretty close to that in this book. And so if I just had more money, how much is more? Well, just a little bit more than I have now, then I'd be happy. As you open chapter 1, you'll see that this kind of pretending game is the approach that, as I mentioned, I believe Solomon will embark on, especially as he opens chapter 2. And he said, you know, I've tried these things. I've tried wisdom. And not just that I tried it, but that God had given it to me. You remember when he ascended the throne of his father David, that God appeared and as it were, offered him carte blanche, the blank check. Solomon, what is it that you would request? Can you imagine God pushing the check across the table, so to speak, for you to fill in the amount, whatever you'd like? What number would you write? What request would you make? Solomon says, well, in summary fashion, I'm not really that experienced. I have a lot to learn. I'm not sure that this great nation and people, I'm up to the task of leading them in the way, God, that you would expect. So please just basically give me wisdom and assistance in this task that I've been assigned. God is well pleased with that answer, the Bible tells us. And in fact, He tells Solomon, I'll give you that wisdom you have desired and your wisdom will excel everyone else. Not just that, I'll give you more wealth. I'll give you the hands of your enemies. I'll give you all of the things you didn't request because of the good request that you did make. And so was Solomon wise? Yes, last week we said he spoke 3,000 Proverbs. The entirety of the book of Proverbs in some way probably traces back to Solomon. His wisdom excelled any before him or any who came after save our Lord Jesus. Wise beyond compare. Solomon said, I tried wisdom. Well, what about Pleasure. Well, Solomon, at least from an earthly perspective, might have at least tried that, and he says that he does. 1 Kings chapter 11 tells us that 700 wives or princesses, 300 other ladies, concubines, were at his disposal. And I know that offends a lot of modern sensibilities, and I can't believe, in fact, uh, probably from the resultant action, we know it must not have even been pleasing to God. But as it related simply to earthly, physical pleasure, Solomon would have had an access, if you want to say it that way, just to be gentle about it, an availability uh, in that regard greater than all who have ever lived. What did he think about that? We'll see momentarily. What about riches? Oh, today, you know... Preacher, if I just had a little more, if I just had a little bit more margin, you know, that inflation graph, it keeps climbing upward. And my wages, they keep going in the opposite direction. We feel that squeeze. And so, you know, if I just had a little more, Solomon had more than just a little more. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 14, the Bible said that his yearly revenue was 666 talents of gold. One 
if you don't know your talent to weight ratio and modern measurement, suggests that that was 25 tons of gold that came into Solomon's coffers every year. 25 tons. Uh, an easier way for me to understand it, if you keep reading uh, down through uh, that particular chapter, it will talk about how he used all of this gold in various ways, making vessels and overlaying uh, his throne and uh, other types of adornment. The Bible says in verse 27, this makes sense to me, the king made silver as common as stone. Silver as common as stone. I know if you've priced, and we're doing a little work out here, Jonathan could tell you more about this. Gravel's not even cheap today, is it, in today's world? But imagine just having such an abundance of wealth that you use silver, as it were, for gravel, just to be walked on, just to fill in spaces. No value whatsoever because the abundance of gold during this man's reign. We'll go back to Ecclesiastes, and you'll see beginning in chapter 2, he said, I tried that. I made my works great. I acquired all of these things. I had building projects. I had women of all sorts and types. Wine, women, and song. Yeah, I tried it. Pleasure and riches, they were mine. And what's the result? Vanity. Hevel. It's all vanity. It's all meaningless. Now, why? That's the question, of course, that should come to the forefront of our minds. Why? If here is a man that had everything that the world had to offer, and while we sometimes say that about whoever, Bezos or Gates or some of those other Fortune 500 and Forbes list kind of people in today's world, even they pale in comparison. Here is a man truly who had all that the world offered. And he said, it's vanity. Why? That question I'm going to reserve for the end of the lesson, but... I started with this one. Where is Jesus? Is Jesus in Ecclesiastes? Not by name. But He is there, I think, in a couple of spots, maybe. In chapter 7, verse 20, if you turn to that chapter, you'll re read the wise man saying, There is not a just man on earth who does good and does not sin. Now he makes that just kind of in um, an interesting section about righteousness and wickedness. But it's a true statement nevertheless, and it points to the universal need for a Savior. There's not a just man or woman. All of us need a Savior because all of us are sinners. So in that sense, you might say Jesus is there. Turning to the last chapter of the book, in verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads. The words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. In your version there, the word shepherd might be capitalized indicating that as it is used elsewhere in the Old Testament and certainly with a New Testament application, the Lord is my shepherd. John chapter 10, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And so in some way, uh, as difficult as it is for us to really grasp, this might be at least a nod toward Jesus, certainly to inspiration, to godly wisdom. This is still godly wisdom. Although it's very hard for us to read this book and not come away thinking, why is life meaningless? And is it really that, that meaningless after all? Let's explore. Let me give you three major concerns in the book that will help us, I hope, understand the book a little better. And then most of you probably already in your mind, you know where we're going, but just kind of hold off in getting there until we can arrive together. The first thing that the book of Ecclesiastes, I think, really helps us with is the march of time. The march of time. Well, what do you mean by the march of time? In chapter 1, verse 9, that which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. There is nothing new. Here's another phrase that appears uh, several times, and it's going to be important near the end. Nothing new under the sun. What has been, it's what will be. What is done is what will be done. In other words, time just continues to march on. There's nothing new under the sun. Chapter 3, long before it was a more popular folk song, Solomon had written, there's a time and a purpose for everything under heaven. The right season. Yes, a time to be born and a time to die. And then in the remainder, verses 2 to 8, 
to plant, to pluck up, to kill, to heal, to tear down, to build up, to weep, to laugh, to mourn, to dance, to cast away stones, to gather them together, to gain, to lose, to throw away, to solder in, to speak, to love, to war and hate, even love and peace. All of these things kind of set in disjunction with each other. There's a time for it. But that time is difficult for us to determine. That time for us seems to not really have any sort of pattern. And that leads to a second consideration that the wise man wrestles with. What about life's randomness? Life's randomness. Now last week we talked about that, he, uh, that in Proverbs the wise man said, here is the way to live life according to moral logic in the way in which God has ordained or structured His universe. And here are the precepts, even though they were scattered and uh, varied throughout the book, that by and large, should you abide by them, if you will give a soft answer, many times you will turn away wrath. If you will be, uh, you know, slow to anger and rule your spirit, you'll get along better in life. If you'll save for a rainy day, then when economic mishaps or downturns happen, you won't be caught off guard. Uh, there were a number of these topics and subjects touched on in the book of Proverbs that said, generally speaking, this is the wise way to live. This is the wise way to live. Live the way that God has structured the world to operate and things will go better for you. Ecclesiastes takes that idea somewhat, though, and turns it on its head. Let me give you some examples. Chapter 3, verse 16. This wise man, probably the same one that wrote Proverbs, he said, I saw under the sun in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. Well, what are you trying to tell me? Sometimes things aren't where they should be and don't happen as they ought, as we ought to think that they should, or think that they uh, should according to God's plan. Chapter 7, verse 15, I have seen everything in my days of vanity. There is a just man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs life in his wickedness. Do you know that to be true? I remember one of the first times I read this. I'm sure it was during my studies at Freed Hardman, when I really paid attention to the actual words, and immediately what came to my mind. Now, I'll just give you this by way of personal illustration. My father was struck with brain cancer and passed away when he was 57 years old. Now, I'm not saying he was a perfect man. He would not want me to tell you that, and he would not affirm it, neither am I. But in my mind, he tried to live for the Lord and live faithful to Him. Taught me to do the same, and I'm ever thankful for it. He was gone at 57 my freshman year at Freed Hardman. Our neighbor, who was actually also a second or third cousin on my mother's side, lived on the lower end, as we said, of the ridge. There was just a ridge uh, that kind of everyone lived up and down on. His name, interesting name, Palo. Here's what he did day after day. As long as I can remember, I remember sitting on my grandmother's front porch and his big LTD would pass by. My granny would say, well, there goes Palo for the first time to the store. Three miles, twisting and turning through what we call the Seven Knobs, that's the name of the road, he would arrive at the little market and gas station that connected with Highway 56, and he would buy a bottle of a certain liquid that they would house in a paper sack. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? I don't know what variety of intoxicating spirit that was, but he would purchase that. And he would get back in his LTD and he would drive home and he would pass and he'd wave at my granny in one hand and have his bottle in the other. We'd be sitting there after lunch and he'd make another trip and granny would say, I guess he's going out for his second. He did that for my entirety of my growing up years. I remember that. He lived well, almost close to 80 and I remember when I was reading this saying, a righteous man, a just man perishes, and a wicked man prolongs his life and his wickedness. God, that doesn't make sense. You know what happened? It's all God, it's not me, but Palo called me because he knew I was trying to study to be a preacher. And he called me after I settled back in that area and he said, I remember how I was taught as a youngster, and I remember 
your daddy and he was a good man. And I know by this time, of course, not surprising to any of us, the cirrhosis of the liver was shortening his life and was going to get the better of him. I need to know more about what God wants me to do. He was baptized into Christ and lived about six months thereafter. Perhaps, I don't know what is discussed in eternity at length, but maybe he and my father are discussing some of those things even at the present. I don't know, but the randomness of life. We look at life and we say, God, this isn't the way it's supposed to work. The guy that doesn't care anything about you, strike him down. Those that are righteous, let them continue to live. If you keep reading the same section there in chapter 7, look at verse 16. Do not be overly righteous, nor be overly wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Don't be overly wicked, nor be foolish. Why should you die before your time? It's good that you grasp this and also not remove your hand from the other, for he who fears God will escape them all. That's random. That's tough to deal with. One more, chapter 9, verse 11 he said, I returned and saw under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill, but time and chance happen to them all. Life is random. Now, is this a fatalistic philosophy that the writer is asking us to adopt or some sort of deterministic uh, philosophy that life really has no meaning? It seems to me that's where I'm pushing you, isn't it? That seems to be where the wise man is trying to pull us along to, but just kind of hold those thoughts in your mind. One last idea before we get to the point of the book is the wise man wrestles with death, the universality of it. Chapter 3 and verse 19. What happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them all. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. Do we believe that? Did he believe that? Chapter 7, I often thought of this verse when I worked in the funeral industry. Better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. It's better to go to the funeral home than it is to a party. The wise man says, why? That is the end of all men. The living will take it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. By a sad countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the funeral home. Modern translation. The heart of the fool is in the party scene, the ball game, the movie theater, wherever you want to insert there. Joy is typically found or prescribed in this life. Does that make sense? Is that really what life is about? Chapter 9, verse 3. It's an evil that's done under the sun. One thing happens to them all. Truly, the hearts of the sons of men are full of madness. It's in their hearts while they live. And after that, they go to the dead. They go to the dead. Now, what do we do in view of these realities of life as the wise man presents them to us? Here's what I'm going to tell you, and this is kind of where the, the graduation speech thrust comes from. Surprisingly, what the wise man says to do is to enjoy life with the blessings that God gives, which is something that I think a lot of us struggle with. We think that there is some sanctified holiness in being an ascetic, even though we're not, you know, commanded to live that way. And by that, we think that depriving ourselves of joy and living, uh, you know, in a way where we can maybe pat ourselves on the back and looking and evaluating ourselves compared to others, saying, well, you know, I'm not extravagant in that way. I don't live high on the hog like they do. Is that what really life is about? I need to hear these words, so maybe you do too. Chapter 2, verse 24. Nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink, that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. Who can eat or who can have enjoyment more than I? For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to a man who is good in his sight. But to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting that he may give to him who is good before God. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. It's a challenge to understand. Nothing is better, verse 22 of chapter 3, that a man should rejoice in his own works. That's his heritage. Who can bring him to see what will happen after him? Chapter 5, uh, verse 18 and 19. Here's what I've seen. It's good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor. Eat and drink and be merry? That doesn't sound biblical, except here it is. All the days that God gives him, it's his heritage. 
For to every man, look at verse 19, to whom God has given riches and wealth, given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. In other words, there is some instruction in this book that the blessings that are provided to us in life from God are to be used in an enjoyable way. Not in a selfish manner, not so that we would forget God, but so that we would be pointed toward Him in some way. If you want a, uh, another section, chapter 9, uh, verses 7 to 10. Live joyfully with the wife whom you love all the days of your vain life. I don't enjoy my marriage, some might say. Well, you need to start. You need to do your part in that. She might need to do her part. Both of you need to do your part in that. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Do your best. Live life and enjoy the blessings that God has provided. Why? Well, there is one conclusion. And it's all the balance. is all meaningless. I said that he wrestled with death. In chapter 11, you begin to see this transition. You begin to see him asking about things regarding the march of time, the randomness of life, the universality of death. Where is it leading? Well, verse 9 of chapter 11, For all these God will bring you into judgment. So, chapter 12, verse 1, Remember now your Creator. This is the convenient uh, commencement speech portion. Remember your Creator, young people, in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come. And then the metaphor begins, the comparison, the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. When eyesight dims, when the keepers of the house tremble your hands, when the strong men bow down, your back doesn't hold you strong and erect like it once did, but now you stoop. When the sound of grinding is low and maybe your teeth fall out or even the false teeth that you have don't do the job like they used to. Remember all of these things because time is leading us toward something, toward death. Silver cord is going to be loose. The golden bowl is going to be broken. The dust will return to the earth as it was. The Spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities is all vanity. Are you discouraged yet? Are you depressed yet? Are you like, preacher, why did I even show up this morning? What, what is this about? If Solomon be the author, and I think it makes most of us feel better. I'll just say it for what it is. It makes us feel better to think that he was. Because if you have an acquaintance with the biography of his life, you'll see after being granted that initial wisdom and starting his reign in a very, very godly way, as he begins to accumulate wealth, as he begins to experiment uh, with his building projects, as he begins uh, to take on more riches and pleasure, a decline in his religious devotion to God is also evident, so that by the time you read 1 Kings chapter 11, his heart has been turned away from God. And that's heartbreaking indeed. And we like to think then maybe Ecclesiastes is the reflections of this old man that's done all of that, and now he stepped back. And in verse 13 and 14, the last word in this book where everything is said to be meaningless, he said this is the conclusion of the whole matter. This is what it's all about. Fear, honor, reverence, respect God and keep His commandments. This is man's all. Your version might say the whole duty of man. The word duty is supplied. Really, it's better just to understand it. This is man's all. This is all that life is about. Now, all of these other things that we've talked about this morning, you can incorporate them into the accomplishment of this, but fearing and honoring God and keeping His commandments, that's it. That's a summum bonum. Highest good, the total purpose. God will bring every work into judgment. Here's your reason, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. If you'll allow me a simple turn of phrase, and the lesson will be yours, it's this. Life under the sun is meaningless. That's what this book says, and I concur. Life under the sun, S-U-N, lived only for this life, is meaningless. But life under the sun, S-O-N, is meaningful. And you have to determine, and I have to determine day by day, how I will choose to live. Under the sun, just for this life, or for the sun. 
If you try to figure out life only using yourself or other people, you'll be disappointed every single time. And I need you to hear that, especially if you're a younger person. If you're trying to figure life out only using yourself or other people, you'll be disappointed every time. And if I could add an additional thought to that, it would be this. If you try to get out of life more than it is capable or intended to give, then it's, it's futile. It is vanity. I think that's the overarching message of Ecclesiastes. If you try to get out of life more than it was intended to give, it's futile, it's vanity, it's meaningless. The pursuit of wisdom or money or work or status or power or pleasure or whatever else will prove that again and again and again. I've known too many people and those of us uh, who have lived any amount of time know too many people and we've seen it too often in our own lives, sadly, where we've tried to pursue all of these things and every time they've been disappointing to us. But life under the sun will be meaningful. Life under the sun, Jesus, living for His honor and for His glory and obedience to His word, that's the only thing that will ultimately matter. And whether or not one obeys this instruction will determine if they are wise or not. You remember last week that was kind of the end thought of the book of Proverbs. Uh, wisdom calls aloud. You have the choice. Ecclesiastes follows up by saying, are you wise? This morning, graduate or not, are you wise? No matter what a piece of paper may uh, be granted to you that you can put on the wall to say, here's why I'm wise, here's the piece of paper I've attained, that doesn't matter. Take God's word and use it as your guide. Be wise and obey today. Are you living life under the sun or under the sun, the Lord Jesus, your Savior? If you would live under Jesus, you have to do exactly what verse 13 says, to fear God and keep His commandments. His commandments include that we believe He is the Son of God, that we repent of our sins, and we are connected with Him by virtue of our baptism into Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection. We reenact. His blood in that process by faith washes away our sins. We're raised to walk in newness of life. We're raised to live with a purpose that exceeds anything that this life might offer. And that might be your need to take that step of obedience this morning. Many of us have done that. Many of us, again, regardless of our age, we become disenchanted. We look at a book like Proverbs and we say, yeah, I agree, life is meaningless. It is if I'm trying to get out of life more than it offers. If I'm living it separate and apart from God, you're right, it is. But if I'm living it under His guidance, if I'm living it by His Word, if I'm enjoying the blessings that He's provided and uh, take joy in those and try to be His faithful servant, then yes, it will be rewarding. It will be rich. It won't always be easy. It will not always be free from difficulty, but it will be the life that God wants me to live. As a Christian, are you still doing that? Maybe you've got off track. Maybe you've allowed other things to come between you and your God, between you and your Savior Jesus. Turn away from those. Turn back to your loving Father. Let Him forgive you once more. Let us help you as your church family. Let us help any in any way that we can. Make that known to us and come even now while we stand and sing together.